when I click share screen, I'm getting a screen that says desktop one, iPhone, iPhone cable. I click share, allow Zoom to share your screen, open system preferences. Whomever is the most <laughs> IT oriented, please pop up. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Broadwell, we do also have your PowerPoint. Um, okay. And so, uh, Hearings Officer Amaro could, could run Chair. your screen if necessary. Mr. Chair? Yes, Ms. Amaro. Sorry, um, we're having connectivity issues. I'm so sorry. It looks like that might be the issue with Mr. Broadwell sharing. Um, Are you able to share your screen, Ms. Amaro? Let me find out, Mr. Chair. I could also, if, if need be, I can also share it and just, and just prompt the slides for him. I'll be the AV guy. I'll be the AV club guy from, from the high school class with the film strip. Go for it, Mr. Bergman. If you think you've got the capability, let's have at it. It's scary that if, I, if I'm the most technologically advanced person on this call, we're all doomed. Uh, I just like how CML and CCR are working together here. This is awesome. See, that's, it's all about, uh, yes, hang on. <laughs> Mr. Broadwell, I have it on. If you would like, I can share and then go ahead and you can tell me when to go to the next slide. Super. Okay. Do that. Okay. Please. Let me do go that. Ahead, Mr. Morrow. You got it. Thank you for your help. You're welcome. Next slide. So uh, my, my information is organized a little bit differently, so just bear with me a little bit. I'm gonna start with some statistics. Uh, the most important thing on this slide is the last bullet, just to kind of emphasize a theme we hear a lot about these days, the urban-rural divide and every variation of that term and so on and so forth. An important thing to, to know is that in Colorado today, 74% of Coloradans live within an incorporated town or city. And that number, that percentage has been going up for a number of years now. So three out of four people, you know, who they look to for their regulatory structure, for their services and so forth, is their city in Colorado. Uh, and look at some of these sub numbers here under this bullet as well. In Weld County, it's actually 85% of the people up in Weld live within the boundaries of a town or a city. A little known fact about Weld is that they have a phenomenal number of municipalities, 32 municipalities in that county, way more than normal counties uh, around Colorado in terms of the sheer number. I think there are historical reasons for that, railroads, uh, agricultural economy, and so forth. And, uh, 32 municipalities at all, uh, in whole or in part, in Weld. I, I showed the number for Garfield as well, only 60% in Garfield, because they have more exurban population. If any of you are familiar with Battle, Mesa across the river from Parachute. That's an unincorporated uh, uh, community, not part of a municipality. And that one more point about this, 74% live within the boundaries of a town or city. Of the other 26%, it doesn't mean they're all on farms and ranches. A lot of that is also urbanized. Think Highlands Ranch, think Pueblo West, think Battle Mesa. There are, uh, under Colorado's legal structure for local governments, there's plenty of opportunity to build urban levels of density even outside a municipality. And I'll come back to that theme uh, in, just a, in just a second on a later slide here. The other important thing uh, we're gonna talk about in my presentation that Eric already alluded to is home rule is a big, big d distinguisher between counties and cities in Colorado. Look at that second bullet. Of, all of the total municipal population in the state 93% are in a home rule municipality. Only 7% are, are small towns who are still statutory in nature. So home rule governance is the dominant theme for those three out of four Coloradans who live within municipal boundaries. And again, I'll come back to that as well. Next slide, please. 
the uh, you can impress your friends with this uh, with this factoid. Territorial charter cities. There's one left in Colorado, and that's Georgetown. Uh, Georgetown still operates under a charter from I think 1872. Uh, back before statehood, the way you got to legally be a city was to go to the territorial governor and get a charter. And that's how Denver was created, Golden, Central City, Blackhawk, and there's one left, and that's Georgetown. And I think they embraced the tradition and history of enjoying being the one remaining territorial charter city from the 19th century. Um, after we gained statehood, pretty much it was very similar to what Eric just said. Any city or town in Colorado derived their authority solely from the General Assembly, solely from the state. And the state was very prescriptive and micromanaging in terms of how the laws worked in the 19th centuries. Um, and frankly, the next big uh, evolution of home rule was a reaction against the high degree of micromanagement of cities up to and including Denver. State government was very hands-on in terms of managing the affairs of the capital city, and that led to this backlash, and the pendulum swung the other way in terms of creating the constitutional authority for Denver to be its own city and county with a lot of local control over its own local affairs and its powers and its structure and everything else around the turn of the 20th century. And then for the remainder of the, the last century, the opportunity for home rule expanded more and more until, as I said on the last slide, we had now have 103. It started with Denver. Now there are 103 home rule municipalities uh, representing the dominant form around Colorado. Next slide, please. The, uh, the, the basic, I uh, guess, kind of uh, a few moments here on the basic form of government within those home rules and frankly, on some of our statutory cities as well. A professionalization through the city manager form of government. The CEO of the city is an appointed person uh, called a city manager. And this dates from the progressive era, era uh, 100 years ago, where various um, government reform groups in the progressive era wanted to get away from uh, kind of the boss tweed uh, uh, form of, of government that, uh, that, that was reflected in elected officials and professionalize it hey, go get a college degree in public administration as a real professional endeavor and move cities in that direction. And that remains true today that almost all of the home rule municipalities in Colorado have a manager form of government. So the council is elected to make policy, they, they hire the manager and the manager runs the day-to-day -day operations. Now in this, in this form, traditionally, the mayors were a little more than the ceremonial. They run the council meetings and so on and so forth. Often mayors were just elected from the council. But there's been a strong trend in recent years all around the state of mayors in council manager form being direct elected. Just this past November, Boulder switched to that, Littleton switched to that, following in the heels and in the shoes of a lot of other municipalities who switched to direct elected to mayors. But for most of, the, most of these cities, they still have the manager running the day-to-day -day operations. But you'll see more and more in a lot of Colorado cities, the face of the city is the mayor, even though he's technically not the CEO. And you'll see mayors often quoted and stating the positions of their cities and so on and so forth, as more go to, go to that form as well. But true strong mayor form where you elect the mayor to actually be the guy or the gal that runs the city only exists in a handful of places in Colorado. And then some of these are recent. Denver, of course, goes all the way back. But Colorado Springs only switched to strong mayor 10 years ago. Pueblo switched five years ago. Um, and whether this trend continues, who knows. But by strong mayor, all you have to do is think about the president of the United States, governor of the state. You elect the person to actually run the show, pay him a full-time salary, um, and, and, uh, and do it in that way. Not very common in Colorado now, but I think it may pick up steam um, based upon uh, the recent developments in Colorado Springs and Pueblo. Next slide, please. Um, some, some key things kind of riffing off of what Eric just presented a moment ago that I think make a huge cultural difference in terms of how cities and towns work versus how counties work. Right at the top of the list, nonpartisan elections. You're not elected as a Republican or a Democrat when you're running uh, for uh, a seat on a city council. Now, you wouldn't know this. The media sometimes report, reports council discussions by counting the Dems and counting the Republicans, but that's not how you're elected to a municipal government in Colorado, anywhere in Colorado. Um, and so you don't have to run the gamut of a partisan process to be nominated. 
Usually to run for election in a municipality, it's just a few signatures on a nominating petition. You have very easy access. If you're interested in getting involved in your city or town government, you don't have to go through the party apparatus. You're not an adherent to a party platform. You get to run for whatever reason you want to run, and you really do have easy access to the ballot. Um, uh, somewhat related to that is the second point. If you're elected as a county commissioner, it's a full-time job and you're getting paid a full-time salary. Almost universally around Colorado, the members of a city council and the mayors I referred to earlier, they've got day jobs. They're just doing this on a part-time basis, often being paid a small stipend, again, depending typically on the city manager to be running the day-to-day -day operations. But uh, it, it, I think that, re that really makes for a different kind of person that typically is sitting on a city council versus a board of county commissioners because everybody has to, has to multitask. They're holding down their day jobs as well as doing their civic duty by serving on the local governing body. Uh, uh, Eric alluded to the fact that we're primarily sales tax reliant uh, in cities. It used to be, and I'm glad Eric mentioned Wayfair because it is absolutely revolutionary the way the whole world of retail has moved to online, not the whole world, I, excuse me, that was an exaggeration, but the trend is strongly toward online sales. Sales tax reliant, property tax reliant, that has always in my mind had a bearing on land use policy because your land use policy sometimes will follow the money. So if you're a county, you're interested maybe in making land use choices that enhance your property tax base, total assessed valuation, but if you're, uh, sales tax related, you're out there battling for the shopping centers and the big box retail and so forth. And there was some terrible kind of competition going on in terms of land use policies following the money, particularly in the 20th century, but not so much lately. And it's a point that Eric made well a moment ago. As, as, as more sales move online, I, I'm looking for less predatory competition for shopping centers and big box retail. Because if you're collecting a big chunk of your sales tax revenue online, it doesn't matter where the goods are coming from. They're going to be subject to your local, local uh, sales taxes. So I think that's going to take some heat off of some of the land use battles that we saw, particularly along the front range uh, uh, in, in previous years. Um, another big obvious point, but it's important for purposes of the works of this commission, is, is that um, there's a whole issue of annexation. County boundaries are fixed by statute. And, and Eric, I think it's been a really long time before, since any county boundaries have changed. When the city and county of Broomfield was created 20 years ago, I think that's the last time some, some territory was carved out of four counties to create Broomfield. But county boundaries just are what they are. You know? And if you're on one side of a county line, you've got this set of commissioners you're dealing with. And if you're on the other side, you've got another set of commissioners you're working on. But there's, there's never any change. But municipalities grow in space. They grow in space through annexation. And that means that, um, again, using Northern Colorado as an example, uh, it, I, I remember 20, 25 years ago, all these little crossroad towns that dotted the map up in Northern Colorado and Larimer and Weld created a very small footprint. But the footprint of all of those, those 32 municipalities in Weld has grown tremendously as they grow outward in space through annexation. And that brings them more into contact with the oil patch and with, uh, with uh, drilling activities and so on and so forth, because they literally grow in space and increase their land use jurisdictional authority when they do. And of course, broader authority through home rule that Eric already touched on, uh, and then I'll come back to in just a second. Next slide, please. Um, and this is a biggie that I wanted to give its own slide to because it's so relevant to the work of this commission. Um, big difference between counties and cities, initiative and referendum exist in municipalities by the Colorado Constitution. Uh, people have the right to initiate laws, repeal laws, or refer laws through direct democracy in the ballot box. That right does not currently extend statewide to counties. Um, and believe me, uh, and I don't have to tell uh, this group that the presence of initiative and referendum really drives public policy, and it's in two ways. One is obvious, one's a little more subtle. Um, uh, significant changes to the law occur through the ballot box, the state ballot box, the municipal ballot box, in terms of major changes to laws, um, but also the mere threat of an initiative 
strongly influences municipal policymakers if they know that an initiative might be coming, they might have to craft their laws to head it off at the pass or to counter propose something for the ballot. So it's both the existence of ballot, ballot issues and the possibility of ballot issues is a big driver of public policy in, in, within the boundaries of municipalities because of that right that the people have in Colorado to petition for, to, for new laws. Now on the second bullet, what do these have, five municipalities have in common? They're each places where a drilling ban or a fracking ban was adopted, or in the case of Fort Collins, a five-year moratorium on a ban was adopted, all struck down by the courts. But for purposes of this slide, what's important is that they were all put on the law books in those cities by the voters. Each of these represented an initiated measure that was put on the books and then struck down by the courts once they were challenged. And in fact, I don't know of a single city council in Colorado that has adopted an outright fracking ban, for example, as a council measure. Lots of moratoriums, but the bans have tended to come historically before SB 181 from the voters, from grassroots petition efforts before they ran into a stone wall in the courts in each of these five municipalities, three of which, three of which went to the Supreme Court and a couple of which just, just died at the district court level. So, um, so this dynamic, direct democracy, my, through my whole career, wherever I work, it puts a huge imprint on municipal governance and municipal policy in oil and gas and on a lot of other things related to land use and other municipal policies. Um, I and also have to mention, as Eric is aware, there's been this effort for years to extend more petition rights to counties as well so that counties might be subject to initiative and referendum as well. Uh, just last week, uh, the Supreme Court struck down on single subject grounds the latest effort to broaden petition rights to other forms of government in Colorado, um, and the advocates are gonna continue to try to do that, but for now, it's just the state and municipalities that tend to deal with the, the phenomenon of direct democracy. Next slide, please. Uh, the whole history of home rule on one slide is just going to be very basic. Uh, in cities, home rule means a couple of things. It means we can control the structure of our government, the org chart, who does what, and so on and so forth. We have the authority over that and functional, what we choose to do and what we choose to regulate to some extent uh, uh, is, uh, is allowed under the, doc the doctrine of both structural and functional home rule. A bulwark against state control, well, that's kind of true. Um, and there have been many, many battles through the years, some of which I've been involved with, uh, that um, kind of test where the state control ends and local control takes up, or vice versa. Uh, and it's highly subjective, often litigated, um, and certainly was litigated uh, in those oil and gas cases a few years ago in Fort Collins and Longmont, in terms of one big example that's relevant to this commission. Um, so it, it always, it depends in terms of if a municipal client would come to me and say, can we regulate this? And can we tell the state to pound sand uh, and that we're going to control it? They're not going to control it. It depends in terms of an analysis of all these factors that have been laid down by the courts through the years. The courts have said there's some things of statewide concern, some things of local concern where the local law controls over the state. And there are a lot of things that are of mixed concern, including oil and gas. Um, and they've said that on a couple of occasions where state regulations long before 181, state regulations can coexist with local regulations as long as they're not in operational conflict. That's a short way of saying mixed concern. And 181 went the extra mile of saying, actually, locals can do more now in terms of adopting stricter regulations than they could before. An example of a statewide regulation, just to use a one-off example, like cities can't have their own DUI laws. There's one law in Colorado on driving under the influence and what the standards are and what you can and can't do. And there can be no tolerance for local variations or something like that. There's tons of examples of things like that. Who wins in the power struggle? The kind of thing the court looks at is, well, who traditionally has regulated this? What does the constitution say? What does history say in terms of who is traditionally regulated in this area of uh, endeavor? Um, but the courts also looked at, well, is it something with a lot of extraterritorial impact? Is there a need for statewide uniformity? And as somebody who's litigated a lot of these things and lost a few, I can say that these last two are, are one of the main things the court looks at is, 
is it transcendent? Is the effects or the operation of, of this subject or this endeavor transcendent across local government boundaries, not confined to impacts within a particular local government? If it's transcendent, the court will tend to say the state control can, can call the shots in terms of something, declaring something a matter of statewide concern. Next slide, please. Uh, home rule was our original source of land use authority, which you guys are going to be talking about more with your next uh, group of uh, panelists who are going to be talking to you in some more detail about this. Um, I like to say Denver had a zoning code before the state of Colorado said you could have a zoning code because they had a zoning code because they were home rule and they, they actually amended their charter to expressly give themselves zoning authority uh, and they were exercising it even before the state thought about zoning. And that's an example of how home rule provides its own font of authority. We're not dependent on the state telling us we can do it. But the state did adopt enabling acts way back in the 20s. Eric already touched on a significant expansion in the 1970s in terms of land use authority for everybody, counties, statutory municipalities, home rule municipalities, got additional authority in the 1970s in Dick Lamb's first uh, term of governor um, uh, around the time of the mid 70s. Um, and of course, there's various state statutes like 181, where you just dotted throughout the CRS that give us specific authority over specific things in different ways. Um, and we look to those as well. And that's been very evolutionary in terms of how different subject matter, I, I, another example, like transmission lines for Excel that go across multiple boundaries. What's our authority over that? Uh, you have to go to the statutes that specifically talk about transmission lines, hard rock mining, quarries and gravel and so forth. There are issues there in those statutes. So, uh, so to know land use thoroughly in the CRS is not just about the statutes governing municipalities and counties. You got to look elsewhere in the law books as well. Next slide, please. Um, this is something that, again, maybe states the obvious, but I want to point it out from an old guy's perspective who's been at this for a really long time. I went to planning school back in the 70s and came to Colorado in 1982, and it was all pretty basic back then. Standardized zoning. You know, your zoning defines what you can do with your property. Uh, and then you maybe pull a building permit, but that's about it. And it's like zoning was defined by districts, and if you're in this district, you can do this. If you're in that district, you can do that. Very, very basic going all the way back to the 1920s was the way it used to be. But the dominant theme now, the new school of thought, is highly negotiated development approval on a case-by-case -case basis. It's not about what the standard zoning district requires. Well, often you hear stories about big developments, complex developments being negotiated by city staff, uh, by uh, uh, planning officials and so on and so forth, neighborhood groups, the developer, the applicant, something might be in the works for months before it actually sees the light of day at a planning board meeting or, or a meeting of the governing body. And that's because things are so highly negotiated now. And all these things I mentioned here on the slide are ways of saying that, that, that the negotiation tends to be, we will say yes, but conditionally. And you're going to have to meet these 20 conditions for us to say yes. And a lot of that gets worked out in lengthy public processes before it even gets to the final approval. That really is the way of the world in modern Colorado. And it certainly carries into oil and gas too. You all are familiar with operator agreements, uh, the, last, the last bullet on the slide. That's a, an, a, an example of what I'm talking about. And it's kind of an evolution of what we call free development agreements have been around for a while, where a big conflict, complex multi, multi-phase development and so forth was often highly negotiated through a development agreement. And then it kind of morphed in the world of oil and gas into operator agreements. Uh, and I think a lot, a lot of local governments still basically operate under that paradigm rather than just the basic zoning rules. You know, it gets, it gets actually done in a contractual bit, uh, way as much as anything. Next slide, I think the next slide might be the last, uh, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, I believe this is. Uh, when I came to Colorado in 1982, I was fresh out of planning school and law school, and my degree was in regional planning. Uh, because the 70s were the heyday. It wasn't urban planning. It wasn't city planning. It was regional planning um, because that was kind of the thought. We needed, because land use effects 
uh, in modern urban America transcended municipal boundaries, transcended county boundaries, we really need to all work together on a regional basis to be able to deal with the problems of kind of modern America in those days coming out of the 60s and the 70s. I got out to Colorado not non-existent in terms of any strong regional governance structures. We certainly have councils of government. They certainly do important work, but there's nothing in state law that imbues a state entity or a regional entity with a lot of toothy land use power. Um, the land use power in Colorado is dispersed into individual counties and municipalities with not a lot of transcendent oversight by any, anybody else. Now, I learned when I moved to Colorado that Ironically, in the 70s here, there was a great debate about setting up a state, state land use commission and giving that land use commission real power over areas and activities of state concern, things that were bigger than any particular individual municipality. Um, but that got watered down and eventually eliminated and translated into the 1041 powers that Eric referred to earlier, where they, the state, the statutes still use that term, areas and activities of state concern. But the permitting authority is devolved down to the individual local government, the county or the municipality. Um, so that's kind of a reality in Colorado, and it's the ultimate end local control in terms of um, not having any any powerful entity that, that rights heard on individual counties and municipalities when they make individual land use decisions. Um, constrained municipal annexation powers. In our state, the landowners drive annexation. The Constitution was amended in 1974. Cities can't just annex at will. The landowners drive it, and that also uh, somewhat constrains the ability of cities to control their immediate environs. Strong role of special districts in Colorado. Um, I alluded to this earlier. Uh, Highlands Ranch would be one of the biggest uh, municipalities in Colorado if it were incorporated, but it exists under a special district structure because Colorado law is very tolerant of the creation of special districts, both in incorporated areas and unincorporated areas. And that's who a lot of folks look to in Colorado as their local government uh, rather than, uh, than municipalities. And then as, as, uh, as Eric alluded to a little bit, uh, count, you know, the, the land use authority zoning authority stops at the border of the county and the municipality. Uh, absent an intergovernmental agreement, there's very little ability for counties to tell municipalities what to do in their boundaries and vice versa. There are some nuances and exceptions to that that I could get into if you have some questions about it. But like, like I said, if you live in a neighborhood in a municipality, you look to the council uh, as, as, uh, as, as the folks who are responsive to, to you. But if you live right next to the city county boundary and something's happening on the county side, you don't have that same level of influence. It's just a, a matter of where the boundary happens to be located. Now I'll say that residents of cities, I'll conclude with this, uh, residents of cities are also residents of counties. So every single municipal resident in Colorado is also a resident of a county. They get to, they get county services uh, to some degree, they pay county taxes, but they also elect county commissioners. So if the residents of the municipality don't like what's going on in the surrounding county, they can influence county land use policies through their authority to elect county commissioners. Um, and, and back to my very first slide, as more county residents live within the boundaries of municipalities, the influence that municipal residents and voters have over kind of the character and the policies of their county commissioners is probably going to continue to increase in future years. So that's a quick, breathless run through by me uh, of some basic principles, but happy to answer questions if there are any. And, and if I could, Dave, and that was fantastic. Um, I wanted to add one thing, one clarification. So you, uh, I loved your slide on the, the structural versus functional home rule, um, not to get too uh, nerdy. Um, so, you know, Dave mentioned, you know, we have, we have this functional home rule option for the municipalities, and that's in the Constitution, which is the one that gives you this broad, broad grant of authority uh, and power to do things that aren't, aren't enumerated in statute otherwise. Counties, however, are constrained to what's called structural home rule, um, and that basically, and um, there's no additional grant of authority, uh, per se. It really just allows you to, for example, you can appoint some of the people who are normally elected, like, I mean, like, uh, and we only have two home rule counties, two structural 
um, home rule counties in Colorado and they're Weld County and Pitkin County. Um, now, again, Broomfield and Denver are both cities and counties and they take full advantage of the, the that functional home rule option. But um, the one unique thing though, is that if you, if you are a home rule county like Weld and Pitkin, you do have uh, the right of initiative is, uh, is actually guaranteed for those citizens. So ironically, he's right that we, 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 don't, we don't have this broad grant of initiative power at the county level in Colorado, except for in those two counties that are, that are home rule. Um, and so it's, it's a little bit of a nuance, but it's an important one. Uh, and he's right, every few years we do see a, attempts to um, extend this initiative power to the counties. We push back pretty hard. Um, we've got a lot of horror stories out there. Um, the other thing I would say is uh, the, um, uh, there, there is there is a limited right of initiative for every county. I mean, it's like, you know, recall elections thing. There's taper questions. There's uh, marijuana, you know, things you can put on the ballot. So there's, there's limited right, but there is not this broad grant uh, of initiative power. And again, that's kind of a it's splitting hairs, but there's a, um, there's been several state Supreme Court cases that have upheld, and they were both land use. I think they're both population growth caps that people try to put in place, one in Teller County and one in Mesa County, so um, that have been upheld. And so anyway, it's a very small, it's again, it's, for, nerd, for you know, geeks like us who do this, you know, for the last 25 years, uh, we uh, enjoy talking about it, but it might be a little too much detail for this group, but I just wanted to clarify that. And I, and I will take questions now, and again, thank you guys for your indulgence and your, your patience. Mr. Chair. Yeah, Mr. Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Mr. Broadwell and Mr. Bergman. Um, you know, again, the, the depth of ex experience that both of you have, you know, on these topics is exceptional. And I appreciate you taking the time to share that experience with us. Um, just to kick off kind of the, the parameters of questions. And I, and I encourage all the commissioners to ask lots of questions uh, to these two, because they do have that level of experience. Um, but uh, CML, CCI are, are presenting the 30,000 foot level, <clears throat> and uh, which is part one of the local government informational presentations. And then part two will be more at the 5,000 foot level. Uh, so really getting into the weeds with the part two. However, um, certainly these two have uh, plenty of experience to answer whatever questions you may have. And they've also been uh, given the ability to defer any questions to the 5,000 foot level uh, should they need to. So, uh, so anyway, ask away. Commissioners, questions? Commissioner McGowan and Commissioner Nanjapa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks for the presentation today, super helpful. And it's always good to get a reminder of, of who has um, what authorities. From, from my perspective and and hoping a five for a 5,000 level foot response, but um, it appears that there's conflict in planning for municipalities trying to figure out how to balance oil and gas development with residential development. And I'm wondering if from your perspective and working with cities and counties, kind of what their biggest issues are in trying to balance those needs and the authority that they have. Mr. Yeah, Bergman first. Eric, go ahead. Well, I, I'd say it's it's you know it is a little bit different for us, and I um I think to um since you know the unincorporated areas we have some unincorporated areas. Obviously, you know you think of Highlands Ranch for example is you know if they were to incorporate tomorrow, that's unincorporated that that development. Um, I, what I've heard is I think I think if they were to incorporate down there in Douglas. That would like instantly be like one of the top 10 size cities in Colorado. It's a huge development, a huge urban level development, but largely that's the exception that uh, more than the rule. And um, being much more of a, I think, you know, the more rural areas of the, of the county being in the unincorporated area, not the incorporated, um, our needs are, are, our conflicts aren't as great. I think it's more, uh, what we see is more subsurface stuff, you know, with, with landowners, you know, who are doing other things, you know, agriculture and other types of things like that, as opposed to urban level development that's butting up against, you know, oil and gas stuff. Now, you know, some of the stuff we have seen, and we talked about, you know, some of the, 
times we get crosswise. We all know that that Broomfield Adams County situation a few years ago where, you know, where the county was saying, okay, we're going to do this here and we're going to allow this here. Well, the this here happened to be right in direct proximity to, you know, to, to Broomfield and there was a little bit of a dust up there. But again, that's part of that, you know, that trying to find, find that, you know, that dovetailing of, of, you know, urban level development and, and planning with, with the county level planning. And that's, a, and again, with the rapid, rapid growth. And we all know, you know, we are, I think we're back to being like the 10th fastest growing state in the nation. And obviously Weld County is the fastest growing county in Colorado right now. You know, it's, it's replaced Douglas County in that regard. And so, you know, we're going to continue to see these kinds of conflicts, you know, with, with continued energy development, of right uh, existing right in direct proximity to you know burgeoning population growth and you know new roads new houses um so i think that's you know working across the you know not across the aisle but across <laughs> across the incorporated boundary with our municipal partners is critical and i think we've seen you know a lot of good examples of that going the right way and we've seen some of it not going the right way but communication is essential and um i think continues to be the you know the rallying cries and we've got to work better together but i'll do it and i'll let dave go yeah. Let me just comment briefly and not to be redundant or anything, but my sense of, you know, on the municipal side of the line is that in general, the operating agreement process has worked, uh, ha has been a successful mechanism to reconcile, you know, the, 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 the rights of the mineral interest owner to, to drill and to be able to access the resource with the need to mitigate through condition upon condition upon condition uh, some of the uh, adverse effects related to adjacent land uses. Uh, it's worked out well from a negotiation perspective. From the perspective, I think, of the cities we've heard from, and by that I mean the city managers, the plan directors, and the elected officials. But whether the grassroots populace agrees that the deal was good enough uh, is always, it's back to the direct democracy thing and the grassroots democracy is, is going to be in the eye of the beholder. But the people who kind of, I'm most closely in contact with city officials um, have been pleased with what they've been able to achieve through, in general through the operator agreement process. The other thing that you can obviously have, and this is, this is a dynamic in some communities in Colorado, an operator agreement negotiated by the last council but now you've had a, maybe a change on the council with different perspectives that have come in. And to what degree does the new council disagree that the deal that was cut previously is adequate? And uh, I'm not gonna name names, but you're probably familiar with a couple of those examples on the front range. I don't know so much about the West Slope, but, um, but uh, that's been, the, the horse folks have been riding has been depending on that to, to basically mitigate um, uh, conflicts uh, in most of their communities. Commissioner McGowan, follow up. Okay, seeing none, Commissioner Nanjapa. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you both for the information. It was um, definitely very helpful in, in sort of understanding these authorities. And I think, you know, this is the thing in, in terms of po other policy work that I've done that I, I think people um, don't the general public doesn't always understand is that you can only do what you have the authority to do and you know what's um within your purview and um but there so there's a couple of things that i just wanted to make sure that i i understood clearly um let's see i, I think the first one was that i believe uh between both of your presentations there was the mention that in with respect to county revenue property tax is the main revenue, but with respect to municipal revenue, it's more sales tax, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's really interesting uh, as it relates to you know, Commissioner McGowan's question and that balancing of um, these different types of development. And obviously, you know, we hear a lot from our um, impacted communities uh, with respect to the proximity of, of locations and a lot of times um, you know, maybe the location was agreed upon many years prior to when the development was actually built, uh, you know, and maybe the permit for the location, et cetera, was approved many years before the development, the residential development was built. Um, and I think, you know, you, you sort of touched on this here. Um, with respect to the, the, the operating agreements, um, and 
sorry, let me just find my, my notes on this piece. Um, So I think uh, it was it was sort of I, I believe this was um, in Mr. Broadwell's presentation with respect to sort of the old school versus the new school and um, how in the, the sort of newer way of doing things are these highly negotiated um, case by case approvals, et cetera. So so does that mean that um, well, yeah, I mean, I guess I suppose that in in saying that case by case, there could be one instance where uh, the negotiation results in a conditional rezoning or other special use permits um, that the mun municipality is making that call and um, and is able to do that may differ from say uh, another residential development that's in, within the same municipality um, boundary is that correct uh. I, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. My, what, what I understand from our members is that they're tailored to the particular location that, that uh, the, the activity happens to be centered on. And so that's why it, it'll vary. It's not, it's, it's not necessarily responsive to some uniform template that is gonna, where the agreement's gonna be the same in different parts of the community. By, by being negotiated, there can be variations. And my point, the broad strokes point I was making earlier, which is under old school zoning, there was no variation. The idea was that everybody in this zone district was subject to the same parameters for how you would build this or develop that, right? And, and, and we've, we've just kind of blown through that now in this new world. And it's not just about oil and gas, it's for other things as well, where, where it's tailored to the circumstances of a particular development. Thank you, Mr. Robert. Yeah, that's, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, that's 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 exactly kind of where I was going. Is that that um, the the old school was sort of that you know this is the zoning, this is what it is, and this is what it always will be. But now it sounds like there are a lot more of these site specific negotiations, right? That may change the zoning based on whatever is agreed upon. Um, and yeah, I guess more of a more of just an observation or, or um, and I'll, I'll look forward to hearing more when we get to the 5,000 level, um, uh, 5,000 foot level presentation, but it, it, it appears then that the, the property tax revenue piece of this does probably play into those negotiation decisions. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, look forward to kind of getting into that a little bit more with respect to um, Thinking about how all these, you know, how all these different um, land use uh, agreements and, and decisions uh, come into play and interact. Um, the last thing I just wanted to ask was, with respect to the structural and functional, it, um, Mr. Bergman, you were kind of getting a little more in depth in this at the end, and I, I didn't, I was scribbling notes from the mm -hmm. last bit of, of Mr. Broadwell's presentation, so I didn't fully catch. But I think what you said um, was that. Weld and Pitkin counties are the only ones that provide the right of of initiative, and you're you're speaking to ballot initiatives. Is that what I'm understanding? Correct. Yes, correctly? correct. Okay, but most don't. Most other counties do not have that. They don't have. Yeah, it's it's just it doesn't exist, and it's not. I mean, they couldn't give it to them if they wanted to. Is what I'm saying. And the, but but the the statute on um, this this what we call structural home rule authority for counties, it explicitly sets forth in the statute that you shall give the right of initiative to the citizens as part of this home rule uh, process that goes through and this home rule charter that gets adopted must feature uh, the right of initiative for the citizens there. Um, it's funny because I get, I'll get a call two or three times a year from a citizen who is um, curious about home rule for their county about, and, and almost you know nine times out of 10, it's because of the home rule or it's because of the, it's because of the initiative power that's, that comes with it. Um, and, 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 you know, and again, so, I mean, that's, that's part of the, there's a whole, there's not a whole lot of bang for your buck, quite frankly. I think, you know, you'll find, I think Weld County and Pitkin County are very happy with their home rule charters and the, the process they've gone through, but it is a lot of work. Um, and it's, it takes, you know, months and months, you need to find a way to pay for this whole process. And there's really no guarantee of the outcome you might be trying to get when you go into this, because you're going to have a, 
you elect a home rule charter commission that then goes and drafts the charter and then the charter has to go before the members the entire county again to get adopted it's a lot of work and they said for the return on the investment you know you can appoint a few more people that you would otherwise have elected you, know, you can set your own salaries for the elected officials but um it's and actually yeah you can actually go to nonpartisan elections which is really interesting um, which is not that not used that much, but it is an option in the, in the home rule uh, charter process for counties. But, um, but again, I think the reason we've only got two out of our 62, you know, uh, uh, statutory counties that have, that have gone this route is because, again, there's just not a whole lot of uh, return on the investment for all that work, unlike municipal home rule, which is, boy, it is so, so far reaching and, and, the, and the powers that are granted once you go to that home rule status uh, for a municipality, which is why you've got, like you said, 90 some percent of the, you know, people in Colorado live in a home rule municipality now. So very different, very, very different outcomes and very, very different uh, stakes. Thank you. I would just um, point out along these, uh, you know, this, this issue that Mr. Broadwall has raised of municipalities using the operator agreement approach um, and, and as that Mr. Broder is aware, I've represented some of those municipalities in negotiating some of those operator agreements. And, you know, I am, I'm interested to see what's, what happens next because SB 19181 did provide expansive uh, additional authority to local governments. And I'm, I'm interested to see if the pivot is going to be regulating as opposed to continued operator agreements, because one of the reasons operator agreements were done is because we didn't, local governments didn't have as expansive uh, authority over oil and gas. And so they, they pivoted to the contractual authority that existed. And um, so I'm interested, and I don't know if you have any thoughts about that, Mr. Broadwell, in terms of what municipalities may be thinking. Um, that's my first comment. And then my second comment to, to both of you is, is one, thank you for your wonderful presentations. But, um, you know, one of the things that, that we struggled with in our rulemaking and implementing 181 was trying to achieve that right balance of recognizing local authority and recognizing proximate local government authority. So nearby authorities, so where that Adams-Broomfield conundrum existed, where Broomfield was putting wells near Adams and Adams didn't have a whole lot to do with that. And so I, you know, one of the things that I think we've tried to do is, is to try to address that in our authority so that we can address those issues where there's competing things. So that's kind of two completely separate comments, but it's my, my scattered thoughts as I'm listening to these great presentations. Jeff, I'll comment that right after 181 was adopted, I thought we were going to see a tidal wave of municipal ordinances jumping into more of the regulatory side. And it's happened in a few communities, and you may know this better than I, but, but it, it's frankly been quieter than I anticipated inside municipalities. I can't speak for the county side. You know, it's like, it's like even though municipalities have grown in space uh, a lot over the last 20 years, still most of the wellheads are in unincorporated areas. Uh, and there's some highly contentious ones inside municipal boundaries, but, but um, there's just been a lot less regulatory activity than I anticipated two years ago uh, when the law was first debated. Would you agree that it's been less than you would have thought? Um, yeah, I, no, I, I, I do agree. Um, you know, in some of my discussions with local governments, I know that there was um, a lot of wait and see approach to sort of wait and see where commission ended up so that perhaps then there could be more of a tailoring of that. Uh, and I know Commissioner Messner and I are doing our best to do reach outs to all of the communities across the state. You know, and you know, we, we honor the local authority and, and we want to be a partner. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're doing that reach out. And so I'm, I'm interested to see, you know, what our next steps or developments. I, in my reach outs as well, I'm also much more familiar, uh, Mr. Bergman, with the counties that are exercising the additional regulatory authority um, at this time as, a, as opposed to municipalities. Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and so kind of on this theme, you know, while, you know, our rulemaking did 
um, you know, contemplate, contemplate uh, approximate local governments. And, you know, we've developed some rules you know, around that. Um, there's also a relationship between counties and municipalities in that, in that transition area between the municipality and the county traditionally called the, the, the three mile zone, or uh, it's not always three miles, but I call it the transition zone that oftentimes is developed with an IGA. And so I wonder if uh, either uh, Mr. Bergman or, or Mr. Broadwell would talk a little bit about that and how those IGAs are developed and you know why they're developed um, to help that kind of coordination and collaboration between municipalities and counties. Dave, go ahead. Uh, uh, that's a good point. I mentioned on one of my slides that very little interaction unless there's an agreement. And so one of the things we do have in Colorado to, you know, it's kind of like the counterpoint, the larger point, there's no state law uh, that, that forces, you know, or cross jurisdictional authority over land use matters. Um, but we do have very liberal inter intergovernmental agreement laws that allow the local governments that are motivated to do so uh, to enter into grand uh, uh, development plans enforceable with T if they choose to do it. Uh, and the, the, those laws have been on the books forever. And there are some really outstanding examples around the state. It's motivated by different things in different places, but where you have enlightened local officials that see the broader public interest, uh, they, they, they all share the same larger community, you know. Uh, and so uh, there's some good examples uh, that have been motivated by just a vision a regional vision of land use that everybody wants to buy into collectively. And so when the county's regulating on their side of the line, they'll follow that plan, same vice versa. Um, but I'll also add that some of this related to what I was talking about earlier, predatory sales tax competition and so on and so forth. IGAs have been used very effectively to call a timeout, call a truce, uh, and get agreement between nearby municipalities about what their respective sphere of influence is. We won't annex into your area, you won't annex into our area to kind of take the heat out of that sort of economic competition between municipalities. That was certainly true uh, in the I-25 corridor going up. Uh, first it was North Glen and uh, North Glen and Thornton and then later it was Johnstown and Berthoud. Uh, there were all kinds of conflicts through the years as you go north out of Denver uh, that were solved by good intergovernmental cooperation. Um, but uh, uh, there, are, there was changes to the annexation laws years ago that John's referring to that required municipalities to have an adopted three mile plan. And often that's led to greater cooperation with counties as well. Eric, why don't you comment on that a little bit? Yeah, we've had, um, I mean, I, I, again, I think, you know, you'll see, uh, especially in the, in the north, in the north end, I, li I'm, I live in Westminster, and I know um, w the conflicts and, the, and the, you know, the competition for a lot of years, I mean, I'm more on, like, on, for me, it was on big box, but back when I was doing smart growth for the state, uh, you know, back in the, in the aughts, <laughs> early, early 2000s, um, you know, we were seeing a lot of that, you know, trying to, you know, competing municipalities competing uh to who's going to land the big box and it was based more on just we, we want that sales tax not on where's the best place for this big box to locate from a land use standpoint you know from an actual good plan good you know smart planning and so you know I, igas were in place then you know like westminster and thornton and others that said basically we're going to share the sales tax you know sharing agreements that prevented you know the competition and really focused more on where does this bit large, you know, development make the most sense from a standpoint of, you know, a new interchange on the highway and all the other, you know, externalities that happen. Um, now, as far as oil and gas, for example, I have not been as privy to those because I've, I've kind of, I've, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a recovered land use planner. I, I did it for about seven years with the state, uh, but after coming back to CCI, I've been focused more on I work on marijuana and I work on transportation issues and rural broadband and stuff. So I'm not as front and center on some of the oil and gas issues. And I'm every day I say a little prayer of thanks for that. But uh, <laughs> I know that um, the, the continued conversations that are going on, you know, and, and like I said, I can't preach it enough, you know, this, the, the coordination that's required. And it takes a lot more time and a lot more effort and a lot more uh, work and sweat and toil. But, um, but the payoff is so much greater when you have, you know, like I said, a good three mile plan that where there's agreement on where we're gonna have the new development go. Um, and it's not just happening willy nilly. We saw a lot of that, you know, in the late nineties with kind of just this, you know, um, uh, the, the urban sprawl, quite frankly. And I think there's been a lot more 
rein in of that now and a lot more thoughtful process going in and thoughtful dialogue between again the county commissioners and the mayors and, and council members on what is the right way to grow and how do we do it right and this has been you know front and center on some of those conversations is as the use of these igas uh to dictate how we're going to move and again oil and gas fits right into that and again i think you know i agree we've been we've seen a little more of a wait and see after 181 where it was adopted um I think there was initially a thought that it was going to be much more like, like, like Dave said, kind of a, a bum rush where we're going to see a lot of people adopting stuff. But I think a lot, most people are trying to wait and see what the rulemaking looks like, how things turn out uh, before uh, before dipping their toe in there and, and, and enacting more. And again, you're going to hear from, you know, I mean, Bruce Barker is one of your presenters, I understand, on the next phase of this. And he's a Weld County attorney, brilliant guy. And I think, you know, you'll hear I mean, they, they have really taken this on and adopted a whole bunch of new regulations. So they're kind of one of the... Uh, ones that have moved forward in the wake of 181, but um, you'll have, he'll have more to say on that next week or the week after. I apologize, I'm not sure when that next session you guys have is, but. Mr. Chair. Yeah, Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, 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 and great explanation there. I mean, I do think that that ends up being uh, an interesting topic of discussion, you know, as, 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 as we're looking at working with local governments, but then also, you know, in my opinion, there's certainly an onus on local governments as well to, to work with one another, right? I mean, I think it's easy for um, local governments that perhaps are in conflict, you know, in that three mile area or in that transition area to look to the state to resolve those. And certainly we've promulgated some rules that certainly create some uh, ability to um, consider proximate local governments, but, you know, really the local governments also have the ability to do what inevitably is super difficult, which is coordinating and, 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 and developing these IGAs, right? I mean, this is, I'm not suggesting that this is an easy thing, uh, but certainly does enable them to have the authority to do that and, and control their own destiny in some, in some respects in those areas. And so I think that's an important topic for us to dive a little further into, particularly as we hear from different elected officials local government elected officials, you know, through our public hearings here. So I think that's a, a good topic. <clears throat> Agreed. Thank you, Commissioner Messner. Other commissioners with questions for the panel? All right, I'm not seeing further questions. Again, thank you both for the excellent presentations. Um, this is really helpful. I. Uh, you're part and parcel of this educational piece for our commissioners, um, for all of us to understand um, our uh, partner communities that are out there. And so this has been very helpful and um, actually does tee up the next set of presentations from specific local governments that we are working to get uh, teed up and we'll look forward to that uh, discussion as well. So thank you both for being with us. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. We'll see you guys soon and uh, doors always open. So take care. Great. Uh, commissioners, we've been going at it for a couple of hours. Um, I would suggest perhaps a 10 minute break. Uh, let's uh, maybe take a break and come back at 1110. Um, and at that point, we will hear from our staff about the Martinez Erwin Public Project Fund.
All right, welcome back folks. Uh, it is uh, 1110 and so we'll get started again with our agenda. Uh, really great uh, discussion with our last two presenters. Um, we're now moving to consideration of a new project under the Martinez Irwin Public Project Fund. And I believe we have a presentation by Deputy Director Cuthbertson, uh, Environmental Manager, Mr. Greg Duranolo, and perhaps uh, we've got uh, Ken Mendoza Cook, Director of the Regulatory Affairs and Advocacy for Occidental Petroleum. I'm not sure if Kim's presenting or not, but uh, I see Scott all set up in his coat and tie. Good to see you, Mr. Cuthbertson. Uh, Good morning, morning, Chair. Thank you. Good to be here. So we don't really have a presentation today. We, uh, we presented last week the project for consideration and provided uh, the commission with all the materials. Uh, they are also on the uh, regulatory um, portfolio, the hearings portfolio for today for your referral. Um, so we're really here just to maybe answer questions. Uh, last week, the commission um, believed it was appropriate to not take any action on staff's recommendation to fund this project, um, but instead to notice that and be able to have that as an action item uh, after deliberation today to decide whether or not to approve uh, that project under the uh, terms of the administrative order of consent. I will tell you that uh, since last week, um, Occidental Petroleum and uh, specifically um, their regulatory affairs director, Kim Cook, has, uh, has indicated Occidental's approval of the project from their perspective uh, with, the, uh, with the interest of wanting to participate in just uh, the project construct, which we think is completely appropriate. There will be most of these projects um, uh, develop a board uh, or a, a, an advisory board to uh, to oversee the implementation of the project. Um, CSU's MeTech project, for instance, is the one that I'm, I'm most familiar with. Um, and so I, I think it would be completely appropriate for uh, Occidental to have a role in that advisory capacity. Um, but so they have now consented or uh, given their tacit approval to the project with that one condition. And that uh, written email is also in the hearings portfolio, but um, if you'd rather hear that directly from uh, Regulatory Affairs Director Cook, uh, I'm sure she would be happy to address the commission. It's really your pleasure, Chair, to determine what you need from us at this point. Thank you, Mr. Cuthbertson. Um, you know, I'm comfortable in moving forward. We did hear from you last week. We I think there was consensus that this is the next appropriate step uh, for phase four of the aerial methane survey project. Um, and so, you know, I'm comfortable moving toward a motion. Um, we didn't have it agendized for an action item last week. It is set up for that today. Uh, but I will look to my fellow commissioners if you wanted to, uh, if anyone feels that there's need for further discussion um, about uh, the project at this point in time or whether we're ready to just move toward a motion. Seeing no, our, our Commissioner Nanjapa. No questions, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, but I just wanted to express appreciation for the additional materials provided. And um, if, if there are no additional questions or concerns from other commissioners, I'm comfortable with moving that we approve. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to approve the uh, project before us. Uh, any additional discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Very good, the motion carries. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cuthbertson, uh, proceed. Thank you, Chair, I will, uh, I will carry it from this point, thank you. Okay. Uh, next on our agenda is the consent agenda. There were three items on consent. Does anyone have any questions, comments uh, about consent agenda? 
Seeing none, uh, do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. Uh, is there further question? Seeing none, all those that uh, vote to approve signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Consent agenda carries. Uh, at this time, uh, we will move to commissioner comments. Um, do we have comments from commissioners? Mr. Chair, nothing of substance for me, but I did want to thank uh, Mr. Broadwell, and Mr. Bergman for their presentation. Um, didn't get a chance to do that during um, uh, during questions, and I appreciate the questions from my other commissioners. Um, really helped dial in some um, some aspects for me. So, and also thank you to Commissioner Messner for putting it together. Excellent, agreed. Um, I have one one comment. Just um, I wanted to acknowledge uh, one of our former previous uh, volunteer commissioners, uh, the director of San Juan Basin Public Health, Leanne Jalan. Uh, Leanne Jalan was uh, nominated and yesterday received the American Medical Association Nathan Davis Award, um, which is pretty phenomenal and it is absolutely worthy. Uh, Ms. Jalan is the director of the health department down in my community for Archuleta County and La Plata County. Um, she has led that community's efforts in dealing with COVID uh, phenomenally. Um, I'd like to read um, a quote from Senator Michael Bennett um, into the record um, to recognize uh, former Commissioner Jalan. Uh, and the quote is, for over a decade, Leanne has driven San Juan Basin Public Health's mission to serve Coloradans in La Plata and Archuleta counties. Leanne's leadership and significant integrity throughout the COVID-19 pandemic is a model for thousands of public health leaders throughout Colorado and the country who have worked under extremely difficult conditions to keep us safe. I am proud that the American Medical Association has recognized Leanne's tireless work throughout the pandemic. On behalf of all Coloradans, I'd like to con congratulate Leanne and thank her for her leadership and service during a time of great need. So kudos and well-deserved Commissioner Jalan uh, and Director Jalan and uh, keep at it. Uh, I know that uh, at times this has been frustrating. I, I would recognize that uh, Leanne's uh, home has been the subject of uh, picketing um, by folks that have not been um, happy with decisions that she and other health directors have made. Um, that is a subject of legislation that I hope passes in the Colorado legislature to allow her to uh, protect herself and her family. Um, so it's not without a great deal of, of, um, of issues that Leanne has been such a significant leader uh, for our state. Uh, but uh, again, just wanted to send out our, our, our congrats to her for a well-deserved uh, award. Here, here. Um, with that, um, do we have other commissioner comments? All right, seeing none, uh, we would look to a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Great. Um, for those that would like to see us in our work session, we'll have another one on Friday. It's on our on our uh, website uh, and uh, we'll be taking up just general business amongst ourselves uh, with no action items. And uh, otherwise, we'll see you at our next uh, uh, weekly um, meeting next week uh, on Wednesday. So thank you, everybody. Be in touch.